everyone to the may recording for the doctor who book club podcast this is matt in minnesota chris in south london and this is sean in texas sean hello hello how are you all (laughs) we're very excited and very honored to have you with us oh it's my pleasure of course (laughs) how did you find us Well, I think Twitter. Well, no, no, actually, actually, somebody told me about you. I have a friend that that DM'd me on Facebook and he said, you know, somebody's taking up the reins. There's a new Doctor Who book club podcast. And I think he expected me to be like mad or jealous or something. I said, well, that's interesting. Well, I don't mind that. That's excellent, actually, because I think that this, at the risk of sounding dirty, this fills a, a, a very important niche in Doctor Who fandom. There are no other podcasts that I know of that talk about the books in Doctor Who fandom. And more importantly, you guys also talk about mostly at this point, the new series, not mm-hmm. just the the new adventures and mm-hmm. the missing adventures and the past Doctor adventures or whatever they're called. I, I forget them now. This is the first, the one that we read right now is the first Doctor Who book I've read since I did our last episode, which I think was the Invasion of the Cat People. So... No, there was one after that that I read, and then we didn't do the uh, recording, but yeah. Well, we, we might. I think that might have been St. Anthony's Fire, which we have uh, planned for later this year, hopefully. So mm-hmm. okay. maybe we'll have you back on if you, uh, if you want. <laughs> if, I'm not, if I don't feel all bruised and bloody from this experience, <laughs> no, it's okay. No, I'm just kidding. Wait, no, is St. Anthony? Oh, yes, St. Anthony, Anthony's Fire. Uh, yes, yes, that it was it. That was it. I don't remember very much about it. I don't know why. I don't read these books drunk or anything, but I, I, yes, I remember a few things about it. Okay. Cool. So before we get into the the book, we'll take a couple minutes and just talk about anything new or exciting that happened in the last month, uh, Doctor Who related, or it could also be show and tell if you have got something cool to talk about from like a merch perspective or tat, as they say. <laughs> Chris, why don't you go first this month? Okay. Uh, so I saw Stephen Moffat. Uh, is uh, he was being inaugurated into the Radio Times Hall of Fame. Uh, so um, so just before the new season started, he was in London South Bank and was just giving a, a Q&A hosted by Frank Skinner, uh, which is rather lovely. And of course, yeah, he didn't give any spoilers or anything about the season. Uh, he did talk, though, about how much faith the BBC has in the programme, which is always good to hear and uh, got very angry on John Nathan Turner's behalf, which is probably also, I think, probably fair. Um, but yeah, it was, it was lovely um, and a great honour to, uh, to, to, to see the man. He's a very good speaker. I, I, I would try to paraphrase, but I wouldn't be able to do justice. But uh, yes, if ever you have the opportunity to, um, to, to hear him speak, it's, he, he is very strongly, very strong, very articulate opinions. I had met him... Um... At the, I think he's only been to one Gallifrey, and I want to say it was back in 2006, so even before the first series had come out, but his uh, Girl in the Fireplace, that hadn't come out yet, so mm-hmm. that was, that, I think, his one and only appearance, and it was pretty brief, but even back then, I think people were, were kind of speculating that he might be the... Uh, heir apparent if uh yeah russell ever left but that's really really cool mm. and in honor of the um, the joy division reference from the pilot i am wearing my joy division tardis t-shirt very nice <laughs> sean how about you any anything exciting yes i have a plan tonight and that plan <laughs> is to watch the tom baker years on vhs oh. i'm so sorry that my thing isn't about the new series or anything to do with the new series <laughs> 
Um, but, uh, you know, it's these special little nuggets of, of fandom that I just get excited about. I haven't seen the Tom Baker years in ages, and I get to watch it tonight. So um, do you all know what that is, the Tom Baker years? Oh, yeah, I've, okay. got, a, I've got a copy of it. It's the only reason I still have VHS player. <laughs> really, I, I'm really surprised that they didn't um, kind of slice that up and put, you know, a little segment on every single Tom Baker um, DVD release, like as an mm. as an extra. That would have been a easy thing to do, I think. To see him just say, "Oh, look at that! Oh, I was with her and <laughs> in, in Macbeth in 1971," and just all these. And sometimes it, they, they completely waste like three minutes of time by showing him a clip, and he just says, "I don't remember anything about that." <laughs> And he just goes on to the next one. It's absolutely delightful to watch. I love him. I love it. Yeah, those those would have been great Easter eggs if they were on the uh, those, especially the clips where he didn't re- didn't remember anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've got a couple quick things. Um, one, I'm getting ready for a Doctor Who convention in Minneapolis. It's uh, May 12th through through 14th. Peter Davison was going to be there, but he canceled <laughs> due to uh, work commitments. But we're still getting. Janet Fielding and Gary Russell and Chris Jones and Arnold Bloomberg and some other people. And then the other thing I picked up, it's like a TARDIS paperweight. It's made out of, uh, it's from a company called Crystal Carvings. And it reminds me of uh, an exhibit by the UK artist, uh, Mark Wallinger, where he created a, uh, it's like a full-size mirror TARDIS. So I'll I'll hold it up, uh, Mm -hmm. but for the benefits of the listeners, it's like a clear, Mm. so it almost looks like it's materializing. And then it Mm -hmm. comes with this, uh, base that lights up that uh can't really see Ooh. it but it turns it blue which is cool yeah that's something it yeah. looks like an award <laughs> <laughs> the first ever doctor who podcast award yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so our book for this month is uh the silent stars go by by dan abnett and before we get into the plot summary just a couple of words about uh the previous stuff that dan's contributed to uh, the world of Doctor Who. He's written three BBC audios, uh, one read by Catherine Tate, one by David Tennant, and he also wrote a Torchwood audio called Everybody Says Hello, which is very creepy, and it's kind of like Children of Earth mixed with Smile um, from the from the new series. He also wrote a number of Doctor Who comics, uh, a Torchwood novel, and the linking material for um, the story of Martha, which uh, has four short stories in it by other authors i'm not super familiar with his doctor who comic work i've read the uh mark of mandragora um chris have you read any of his yeah uh, i was reading them as they were coming out at the time and uh yeah the, the mark of mandragora was probably the high water mark um i i distinctly remember one that i think was called the gift that was basically aliens which is all right uh but yeah but further uh, in the world of comics, uh, so he also, I'm not going to say he co-created Guardians of the Galaxy, because that would be wrong. He, he helped craft the version of Guardians of the Galaxy that's kind of gone into cinemas. Oh. So with his um, sometime writing partner, uh, Andy Lanning. Yeah. So this is a, a busy month for him. I just rewatched Guardians of the Galaxy in uh, 3D this week <laughs> as one of the uh, ones. That's, that's really cool. So the book has... Um, 18 chapters and a prologue Mm -hmm. and the 50th anniversary version has a newly added author introduction and he wrote in there that Pertwee was his favorite doctor or his doctor Mm. and that he also has fond memories of the uh seventh doctor and ace having written for them in the comics in the late 80s too i was gonna say he also uses the phrase proustian tardis um which is um interesting this this book too is the second of the hardcover deluxe books that came out and uh is also set at christmas time so just like last month we have a uh another christmas special i should i should mention that the title is from uh o little town of bethlehem and all of the chapter titles in the book are uh, lyrics from different uh, Christmas carols. And that is the only Christmassy thing about it, other than it's winter, and they talk about Christmas in the beginning, which I guess is okay. Mm. But it's clever. Oh, that's true. It, it isn't very Christmassy apart from, like, the, the winter setting. And, you know, from the Dr. Amy and Rory's timeline... This takes place um, after Amy and Rory are married, presumably after their honeymoon in A Christmas Carol, but before the events of uh, An Impossible Astronaut. They mentioned Ludworth quite a bit and not the uh, flat in London that the doctor gave them. So I think Mm. that's 
I think that's when it's set. Mm-hmm. Hmm. All right, so shall we uh, get started with the, the plot summary? Let's yeah. us, yes. Yeah. yes. So who wants to begin? <laughs> I will, I guess. Okay. <laughs> I'm not the best at this. I didn't I didn't take notes on the plot, but it opens up with we meet a character named Vesta. And she's a girl that lives in this little village uh, called B-Side. And the the names of the villages in this are very important, although B-Side is the only one that we actually get to like talk about or meet, so to speak. And Vesta is going out to uh, visit the grave of her father because it's the, I don't know, maybe the second or third anniversary of his death. And this is a small village that's sort of, uh, what's the word I would use? Maybe a bit medieval. One Mm. gets the feeling that it is a little bit in in older times, although it's not set on Earth, obviously, because it's not an actual place. And she goes to visit the grave of her father. And the the opening chapter of the prologue ends with her seeing, I I think, and correct me if if I'm wrong, I think it's a, a pair of glaring red eyes in the woods and something jumps out at her or or comes Mm -hmm. after her. And then it instantly cuts to Amy, Rory and the doctor in the next chapter, I believe. And they're talking about visiting earth at Christmas time in earth's past. And I get the impression that, that perhaps they were wanted to see some sort of Dickensian Christmas, which of course, if I were in a time machine, that would be the type of Christmas that I would want to see at Dickensian Christmas. (laughs) And so that's the plan. But, you know, either that or like Christmas from 1979 when I was a kid. I don't know. But uh, I'm, I'm dating myself. Well, no, I'm telling everybody. Yeah. The the setting reminded me a little bit of uh, the village in the village of Christmas in Trenz, on Trenzalore. Mm. But yes. But yes. this this very much. I mean, I think this was written in 2011. So. So yes. pr- presumably way before Time of the Doctor and, and all of that. Yeah. But, but that's kind of the imagery it kind of evoked or, or even like the village in a christmas carol too where you kind of yes. have that kind of steampunk layer on top of everything and we're also seeing quite a bit of interesting naming of things because you've got um the um, the graveyard area uh is uh, called would be uh, there's also um, references to kind of guide spell, which is uh, it took me a few pages to realize that this is kind of like a, a sort of a corruption of God as as, mm. as a term. On the naming side, we're kind of striking a fine balance of kind of not quite falling into twee, or at least to my taste. But uh, yeah, I think it's doing a does a good job. The the names were were kind of like uh, the Seva team. Uh, yes. in the face of evil yeah. kind of kind of that corruption of language over yeah. time yeah or yes. state of decay yeah mm-hmm. that's exactly what i thought um yeah. to the point that that kind of bothered me a little bit like hey <laughs> they're stealing that idea of and the doctor has a name for it and i can't remember which story he's he says it if it's state of decay or or the face of evil uh i want to say continental drift but that's something completely different <laughs> um, consonants so. drift maybe or maybe um, that's yeah. it maybe that's it Huh. Um, so, so the TARDIS, um, TARDIS crew are wanting to experience Christmas, uh, and uh, and so Rory has been trying to pin the Doctor down to a commitment that they've actually arrived in Ledworth, um, and the uh, the TARDIS is that they've landed it on a bit of an angle, kind of leanish as it's phrased, which means that the dimensional stabilizers that uh, were a very important plot point two books ago don't seem to be working. Consistency. Um, but uh, uh, they're, yeah, it's very wintry countryside and it's far too quiet to be led to earth. Um, I was going to, I was going to say, if you're, if you're looking for cons- consistency or continuity in the books, <laughs> that way lies madness. Yeah. You are not going to find that. And then if you try to m- merge in big finish and, and the television show, no, yeah. No, it's not going to happen. The Doctor and Amy and Rory leave the TARDIS to explore. Rory decides after they're, they've they been walking for a little bit that he's going to go back to the TARDIS and get a coat, um, effectively splitting him off from Amy and the Doctor for the rest of the, <laughs> of <course>. the, rest <laughs> of the book. <laughs> yeah, they had to split up. Rory wants to be Amy actually kind of points this out as to the fact that this is a very stupid idea. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, like, yeah, yeah, okay. At least we're hanging a lamppost on it. Amy and the Doctor start heading back to the TARDIS because uh, Amy's now getting a bit concerned. And they run into menacing men with farm implements. Uh, <laughs> and the uh, the Olympic Doctor tries to greet them with ho, 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 which is a... That's such a Matt Smith thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, I, I could 
easily picture that. And the uh, <laughs> so the group that meets them, they're known as the Morphins, uh, mm. is kind of the what they call themselves, and they capture the Doctor and Amy and bring them back to really their city hall or their their council chamber. And the doctor um, tries to basically use the psychic paper and say that he's from the next town over and he's visiting their uh, their winter festival. This doesn't go terribly well because uh, one of the villagers happens to be illiterate and is stunned to realize he can read. And so <laughs> the villagers now think that the heroes are sorcerers. In amongst the villagers as well, we encounter a young woman called Belle, who's the sister of Vesta. Uh, and uh, she's very forthright and very much a uh, kind of like a Moffat young female character, or at least to my yeah you know, to my senses. And came clear to me that we were going to be spending quite a lot of time with her. There's also a couple characters. The mm. head of of B side, if you will, or the head or the leader of B side is a gentleman named Bill Groan. I, it's a terrible <laughs> name. Uh, I don't I don't know why they picked that name because everybody has perfectly nice names. But his name is Bill Grown, and I thought that that would be like sort of a play on words or something, like the guide or like um, or some of the other names that they name things here, like B-Side and the Farmers and the Morphers. And then there's uh, there's a lady named I think it's Winnower, Win, Win... Mm-hmm. Winona, yes, yeah, Winona, and she is very, for lack of a better word, religious. These are not religious people as we know religious people, but they they go by something that they call the guide, or they use. Mm-hmm. A vernacular like will you know guide be with us um they're using the word guide as in <clears throat> tv guide in place of the <laughs> word god okay so one realizes very quickly that okay all right they're not talking about a god they're talking about something completely different and we don't know what it is i'll in, much until much later mm. but she is very very strict in following the following the word of guide um, I was gonna say I, I think their their names their last names might even be intentional and like a further corruption of the the language because um, mm-hmm. Vesta and her sister um, you've got Harvesta and I think they're farmers uh, Plowright is a metal worker and I think oh. Grown kind of being a politician I'm wondering if that might some of those might be intentional kind of like how like last or surnames today you know you have like john's son like son of john that sort of thing and there's also samuel crook samuel crook okay um he is a younger man who i think is on the is he on the council or does he just know bell and vesta yeah he think he's like a potential suitor for for one of the yeah. sisters yeah he's obsessed with hats in his first appearance is samuel um, um and the fact that the people in the seaside um, sort of wear hats, and this is some piece of knowledge that he kind of trots out quite a bit. Without wishing to skip too far ahead, I must say I found Samewell annoying. Um, but uh, <laughs> but hey ho, hey ho. Anyways, yeah, no, it's okay. He really didn't need to be in this book at all. He does no. absolutely nothing other than to be someone that they can talk to. Um, yeah. I didn't understand why he was in there at all. Yes, I didn't all... understand his name. I, I kept thinking of Samwise. Mm. So in my head, I was picturing, what's his name from Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Sure Sean know. Astin. That's how I pictured him. And I couldn't help it. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, he reminded me of uh, the character. I think it's Petra Petra from uh, the Hunger Games series. The mm. Oh, yes. Played by the guy who kind of looks like a Lego minifig. <laughs> <laughs> Like, but at least he brings something to that narrative, whereas Samewell, it, there's quite a few scenes where it's, and also Samewell's here. Um, he helps the word count, um, other than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the uh, the doctor and Amy get locked up in the basement of the uh, city hall, and Belle, Vesta's sister, sneaks down there to basically speak with them further to try and mm. find out if they know what had happened to her sister. He doesn't want to wait for the council to argue about it upstairs and the uh doctor uses his sonic screwdriver to um unlock the cage and the three of them sneak out one little thing is the psychic paper um for bell produces a picture of her sister which is quite interesting because i i don't remember the psychic paper doing kind of 
sort of like it, it, emotion driven imagery before because uh, um, so the doctor says that if someone's under kind of great stress or great emotion then it, it can sometimes kind of um, almost not quite work 100% um, so uh, that was interesting mm-hmm. almost almost like her the emotions of her sister like overrode what the doctor had kind of imprinted on the paper and it turned into a picture of her sister yeah 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 that kind of uh brings us to the dramatic reading for the month uh we'll be playing a short excerpt from the bbc audiobook utilized under fair use for review purposes where we pick up i was gonna say so legal (laughs) (laughs) you say that well yeah i say it for cya purposes we just want to say that (laughs) please bbc don't don't sue us (laughs) i can leave it out yeah we can we can leave it out we can leave it out (laughs) Um, yeah, the, we're going to pick up on a conversation between the Doctor and Belle that they're having about the uh, recent events in the village. All right, let's have a listen. It's not just that the winters are cold. It's what the cold winters mean. They mean it could all be failing, said the Doctor. There's more to it, though, isn't there? asked the Doctor. There have been signs. The livestock dead. And some say they have seen people in the woods... Around the plant nation, the shadows of tall men watching us. No one has seen them clearly, but they are big. And they cannot be men, because all men from beside are accounted for. She looked at the doctor. Until today, she said. Yes, but I came and said hello, so it can't have been me, said the doctor. Belle sat down at the table and rested her nose against her clasped hands, as though she was praying. I told Vestra not to go about alone, she said quietly. I told her. She said there were no giants in the woods, and she could scare off any rogue dog. But I had seen the stars, and she had not. The stars? It was the other sign. Stars that go by at night, overhead. They make no sound. I've seen them, and a few others have. Old Winona says that the stars are an omen, the worst of all signs. They warn us that the world is in turmoil, and that despite all our patience, the Morphin effort is in danger. You said something just now, said Amy quietly. The doctor and Belle looked at her. You said you were only letting us out to help your sister, because you didn't want her to die too. Who else has died? Our mother died years ago, Belle replied. Then we lost our dad four years ago to a fever. I won't lose another flourish. I swear to guide. I... She stopped abruptly. Oh, guide, help me, she cried, looking at the doctor and Amy in dismay. I think I know where she went. I think I know. Where? asked Amy. I had forgotten the day, said Belle, scraping back her chair and getting up. Vesta remembers these things. I don't. It's the anniversary of our father's death. She she would have gone out early to lay flowers on his grave. She would have gone up to the memory yard before the start of labour. Then that, said the doctor, is where we should look first. As part of that conversation, Belle tells the doctor that there are colonists on the planet uh and that they're from earth and that the winters over the last few years have gotten uh worse so previously it hadn't uh snowed but for the last three or four years they've been getting increasingly more and more snow and they're worried about like the planet turning into like a never-ending winter or a uh a new ice age and Mm. along with that there have been attacks from uh creatures uh or there have been attacks against the local livestock so you've seen like animal mutilations and stuff that are being discovered throughout the village too and so that's why um the uh, the b-side men are kind of wandering around using kind of you know farming equipment as weapons uh and uh yeah so that they're, they're all basically getting a little bit freaked out uh and there's also reports of silent stars moving overhead which first of all comes up, well stars are silent um but <laughs> um, so yeah okay and uh, then I go, oh you must mean it yeah it's the moving bit that's the remarkable thing but uh, anyway so. it's for the title of the book yes it, it is, is isn't it, it? Yes. <laughs> yes i mean it, it's not the most blatant shoehorning of the title of the book that no. we've read so as as the three of them are leaving that's where uh samwell or samwell uh Samuel shows up and starts following them. <laughs> like a bad smell. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Oh, that's just Samuel. Yes. <laughs> so the uh, 
he eventually meets up with them and they they discover a uh sheep carcass so uh they they find like evidence of the uh all the bad stuff happening mm -hmm. now this 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 part fascinated me because i knew that there were going to be ice warriors because mm. they're i don't know if you noticed but they're on the cover of the book <laughs> um you know it's kind of like you know they have whatever of the Daleks, and then the first ep the end of the first episode is a reveal of a Dalek, and oh my mm. god, what a surprise when you've got an episode called Birthday Party of the Daleks. <laughs> <laughs> so the reveal that there was it, that it was uh, there, there were uh, ice warriors or ice men, as Amy calls them. Oh my god, that there were ice warriors. It's not a surprise, but it confused me because I'm like, well, they wouldn't attack a sheep and kill a sheep and eviscerate the sheep the way that these animals were with like bones and bits left over and just you know blood and and skeletons so that you know piqued my interest unfortunately i i'm, I'm sorry i'm getting into editorializing about the book <laughs> you kind of forget about that until later on in the story put a pin in it because we will yeah put a pin get back it. to that yeah but... So one thing I will say before we put that pin totally in there is um, one of Dan Abnett's comic um, things was um, was Pure Blood, which was a story about Sontarans, including wild non-cloned Sontarans, as well as kind of the cloned ones that we know. So I was kind of wondering whether we were having kind of another variation on that shtick. So it didn't it didn't throw me quite as far out possibly i don't know once the doctor amy and samuel kind of leave the village and they, they go off following the tracks uh that that had killed the the animal and they're cut they're looking for uh vesta as well bell remembers that it's the anniversary of their father's death so she thinks to head towards um the cemetery to see if they can't pick up mm -hmm. on where where she might be going um while all that's happening uh rory comes across uh i think he's stopped first by an ice warrior but he escapes from from the ice warrior so he, so he actually he, he sees one of the ice warriors the ice warrior basically attacks the villagers um and um uh, kind of using a sonic gun and is basically kind of giving a very trouton-esque vibe um which is fair <laughs> enough because this is this was before cold war so uh, yeah we, we we haven't seen the ice warriors in kind of baddie mode in the TV series for a very long time. He uses that moment to escape. Yeah. And then he runs into a like an abandoned building or something where he encounters Vesta, or she, I should say, she hits him on the head with a hammer mm. and yeah. knocks him out. And he's also in in, in an, a kind of a very ice-based action sequence as well on route, uh, where he kind of finds himself kind of uh, sort of stuck on the ice, pursued by the ice warrior, and uh, yeah, it, it, for me it was kind of these things. It felt very visual. Um, yes, and maybe it's because I know Dan Abnett is a comic writer. I kind of I could imagine this in panels. And it's interesting because there's a climactic se sequence. I think mm. at the end of a chapter where he falls through the ice mm. and you think that he's going to drown or freeze to death. Mm. But it turns out that although, of course, there's ice, uh, the, the water underneath the ice is quite warm. Mm. So he follows through that into a kind of underground, or not underground, well, into a basement of some, some kind, I think. Yeah. But it's the, the basement of like a mill and mm -hmm. um, Vesta is there, like like Matt said, she knocks him out. But she explains that that this particular place is used to do something with the water and I read it three times and I still <laughs> didn't understand it. But that's the reason that the water is is warm instead of cold. Mm. Um basically they're they're yeah, but keep keep going. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh no, that's a that's a really important sequence, the yeah. the whole river sequence where Rory falls under it and the water's warm from yeah, it's some sort of terraforming process mm. that's still underway and for it's very fortunate that that happened otherwise he would have been he would have Dead. Been, yeah from, <laughs> yeah so yeah so he he uh is discovered by vesta who knocks him out and then he later wakes up and they uh after his clothes have dried out they leave the building um mm -hmm. and make their way back to the village yeah there's a um there's a nice little bit where uh because i mean i think dan abner it does a very good job of capturing rory um mm -hmm. and there's um there's one bit where it says that rory um decided to add nodding to his list of things to avoid doing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i just thought 
that is so Rory Pond. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I greatly enjoyed Rory uh, as a character in the TV series, and uh, and certainly, yeah, it was it was good to have such a strong uh, uh, sort of sense of his character in here. I think that I think that Abnett actually likes Rory maybe more than Stephen Moffat did. Uh, mm. Rory was given so much to do and so many chances to shine in yes. the story. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's that's certainly true. Back with the um, the Doctor and uh, and and Amy and hangers on in in would be uh, which the Doctor realizes is also would be. Um, <laughs> um, as as another kind of bit bit of kind of neologisms as uh, well is that really neologism anyway he starts banding that phrase around a bit uh, they see footprints in the snow and then there's suddenly some references to last of the Mohicans which I just found quite odd um, is uh, Amy appears to know who um, and forgive me if I mispronounce um, the name wrongly but. She seems to know who Chingachuk is, who apparently is a major character in the Last of the Mohicans. Oh. And I thought, and I thought how, how? I, I don't know. Amy doesn't seem to me the sort of person who watches Daniel Day Lewis <laughs> movies <laughs> or, or read. <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought you were going to say Amy isn't the sort of person who reads, but you said Daniel well, yeah, Day Lewis yeah. movies. No, but, <laughs> I, think, I think also, yeah, she, she's. Yeah, I don't know. She's not a strong reader, I suspect, is our Amy. Um, but, uh, no. <laughs> more, more, more of a doer. Um, but uh, um, the, the snow is kind of getting kind of blizzardy um, where uh, the Doctor and, um, and, and all that lot are. Uh, and the Doctor suddenly starts remembering Scotland and Jamie. Uh, and, uh, and is suddenly kind of dropping heads. Of, oh, maybe this might be the Ice Warriors. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, you've seen the cover of the book. Um, <laughs> so it's the the blizzards picking up, and they make their way to. Um, well, they're they're being chased by ice. Some ice warriors spot them, but they're a yeah. ways off. So they're trying to stay ahead of them, but it's difficult, you know, with pacing to to kind of maintain that. And the ice warriors are pretty relentless in their pursuit. So they find their way to a small. It's called a vent, um, but it's really like a yurt or a hut. Um, mm. And it's made out of uh, what's called ship skin or the mm. material from the um, colonizing ship. So they they manage to to seal themselves in there. There's also an altercation where they're kind of surrounded and they're before they make their way to the hut where uh, the doctor is able is able to calibrate his sonic screwdriver to like be the exact opposite frequency of the sound that the uh, ice warriors use in their sonic guns, effectively like neutralizing their weapons with mm-hmm. like, like white noise basically and uh so that buys them a little bit more time and they mm-hmm. make their way to this uh this hut which they discover isn't a hut at all but it's really an access port to a vast underground complex so they're uh kind of crawling you know moving away the dirt of the floor mm-hmm. they're standing on and uh as the ice warriors are breaking into the into the building the doctor uses the sonic screwdriver like two or three times and mm. then he says well it's running out of juice or yes. you know, I, need, I need to recharge it um and i guess he recharges it by just putting it in his pocket which is i didn't know that was a thing i thought you had to put it, <laughs> plug it to the tardis or something but this is important because yes. at a cer- certain point this prevents him from using it because he's used all the juice in the sonic screwdriver mm-hmm. he doesn't use that word juice that was my word I don't think that would work if he used the word juice, but he it, it becomes important later on. Another little thing to put a pin in, as, yes. as Chris would say. Yeah, yeah. I wonder how it recharges too. If it's like one of those, um, aren't there like certain watches that you don't have to wind, or they're like perpetual motion, where just the slightest like walking motion will like recharge it? Well, he he rubs it at one point to kind of to try to get a bit more energy into it um sort of um as, as a pivotal moment he's there kind of sort of rubbing his hands with the screwdriver from memory but uh yeah so there may be some kind of kinetic energy thing i it's probably best not to think about it. just just yeah remember. if you yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> remember he can't use it he can't use it for a while until he has to for plot reasons anyway 
they're being pursued by the ice warriors and they're making their way down the uh the hatch and i guess there's a very long ladder or uh, tube yeah. that they're making their way down and i'm trying to remember who who falls first the doctor a doctor yeah. falls first and uh, he takes bell and uh, and samewell off the ladder as he goes which is uh, inconsiderate of him and so amy uh, sort of notices that she doesn't hear any screaming or any plops or is so is a little bit freaked out by the whole thing and uh, it's one of the few moments where we kind of get a sense of amy's character because uh, yeah because she is suddenly starting to think that she, everybody that she knows might have just died because uh, she's also assuming that Rory's probably in trouble. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we don't see a lot of vulnerability, I would say, from her. So it was it was interesting. But, uh, but yeah, have, have no fear. She suddenly discovers that there's like a water slide at the bottom of the, um, at the bottom of the ladder and um, kind of sl- yeah, slides on down. Then she encounters a whole host of hybrid rats. Mm-hmm. So for towns of Wang Chiang fans, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's like a whole series of tubes that she falls down and slides on. Like you can tell she's get it going like really far and really deep into mm. the the surrounding ground and like every so often she's her falls broken by like a pile of leaves. And yeah. as as you mentioned, these uh weird rat like creatures kind of come out of the woodwork in the bo- at the bottom of the tunnel and she's mm-hmm. trying to uh to fend them off yeah and again um as i don't remember which one of you said it but again this is a very visual book and this passage is a perfect example of that because the rats are described as not exactly rats or giant rats but they're sort of like cyborg rats Mm. as if they've been genetically bred to attack and hunt and kill and magically the doctor walks right in i'm being snarky i know (laughs) the doctor shows up at that moment Flashes his sonic screwdriver again, gets them to run away. And we yeah. don't run into them again, uh, but it's important to remember that. Another pin, another pin. Get your pins out. <laughs> <laughs> All these pins will add up to something in the end. Yes, yes, mm-hmm. yes. Um, over in B-side world, um, so uh, we're told, well, we encounter a night watchman called Sol, um, and it's emphasized that the night watch has only recently been reinstated due to the livestock attacks and everything. And B side is a lovely place, etc., etc. And uh, and whilst um, Bill, uh, the, um, the the Bill Grown, the the sort of the nurse select, have we spoken about what the nurse select means? I don't know. No. No, oh, yeah. no, because no, this, this becomes important. Uh, so that that's his title, um, which is basically kind of village chairman. But focus on the word nurse again. Pin in there for you for later. Uh, and so, whilst he's trying to kind of figure out exactly how he's going to tell the villagers that um, a lot of people appear to have accidentally died um, uh, due to an ice warrior attack, uh, in come um, the night watchman with Vesta and Rory. Vesta tells Bill that uh, Rory is a nurse elect mm-hmm. uh, because uh, Rory's told her that he's a nurse. Uh, and so, suspicious of this, kind of Bill takes him to, um, to the back room where he's got a secret door to somewhere called the Encrypt that Guide only permits the chosen nurse elect through. I yeah. have a stupid question. Really quick. Yeah. Um, we talked about the language and how mm. these words are actually morphed you know through generations yeah. what's the significance of the term nurse well i know what a nurse is in this book but yeah. why do they call it a nurse i can't figure out where maybe like somebody who tends a nursery <sighs> a nurser i i don't know um i wonder whether it's because because we've got nurseries being kind of like a garden mm. okay so so um at least in british english i don't know what's necessary in american english uh ah, you, okay you do, get, you do get kind of garden nurseries um where you don't have like sort of plants running around in nappies or diapers uh but you have kind of people people kind of cultivating things so that might be where it's come from however yeah it's a remarkable coincidence isn't it um mm. <laughs> very mm. useful uh for for kind of like for for these scenes uh sort of particularly because um is we also hear some references to um the guide emmanuel 
that this is something that uh, only Nurse Alex can consult. Uh, Bill forces Rory to put his hand against the door to see if Guide would let him in as a test to show whether he really is a Nurse Elect. So should we kind of cut back to the Doctor and and and, and Amy in that lot? Because this narrative really switches a yeah. lot back off. It's quite hard to summarise this. It, it does cut cut back and forth quite a bit, and and it the pieces of information we learn in one scene kind of trans translate to the other because we learn yeah. like Rory puts his hand on the the pass key or the 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 bio scanner or whatever, and he's he is allowed into the uh, the um, the chamber. Like the mm. the system recognizes him as human, and then mm. we cut we cut to. Uh, the doctor, uh, Amy, Samwell, and Bell, and they're still being chased by the uh, the ice warriors. They, they kind of go through a series of tunnels and vast chambers and whatnot. Um, uh, so they've not quite encountered the ice warriors again just yet. Um, oh, that's right. Uh, and so the doctor kind of uh, there's a there, there, there's a nice doctory phrase where he's sort of admiring the dedication of the people that built the firmers, the terraformers. So that's what I love about people. They have dreams and grand ambitions. So they start building towards them, even though they know they won't live to see them finished. Uh, pin in there, by the way. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, but I, I thought that that was quite nice and and and, and doctory. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's as good. as they're exploring um, before the, before the ice warriors uh, find them. Uh, I think the doctor has the realization that. He's inside one of the three mountains mm. that uh, he noted earlier in the book, and he mentioned that they didn't appear to quite be uh, actual mountains. Um, kind of like, as as Sean, as you said earlier, the callback to State of Decay, mm. where the castle isn't just a castle, but it's also a rocket ship. Oh, that's mm. absolutely right, yes. Mm. In this case, it's the, uh, the mountains not being mountains, but they're giant uh, terraforming engines that are on mm. the planet and mm. they, and the doctor uh, and that party, uh, they come across a, which looks like a huge um, uh, vat of decaying um, flesh or protein base. Yeah. And they're, they're speculating as to what it could be used for, whether it was originally for food or for um, synthesizing um, mm-hmm. like the, the cyborg rats that they came across earlier, mm. but it, the, the machinery was broken uh, would look like by by sonic devices or sonic drills, mm. uh, letting them know that it was the ice warriors, and <laughs> yeah. and at that point the ice warriors show up as they're uh, in this kind of long corridor with these vats of uh, putrid kind of decaying meat, I guess. Yeah, so, yeah. So they're they're running away from the ice warriors, and it, it's at mm. that that point that they kind of tie into what Rory had discovered, in that uh, the doctor can't open the door with his handprint because he's not human, but the other um, that he's with, so Amy and Belle and, and Samwell can open the, and close mm. the doors behind them. Mm. So that gives them a little bit of uh, extra time as they're opening and shutting doors between them and the Ice Warriors. And they make their way to what turns out to be like an auxiliary control room or bridge um, where they have uh, access to what looks like uh, communications equipment. And, and also, um, is it is it at this bit where the doctor suddenly um, he, he he makes when he's speaking to the ice warriors, um, uh, sort of like in, in passing, probably whilst running, um, he makes that reference to kind of warriors of the Transor clan. Yes, and starts yes. basically kind of um, dropping hints, say, "Hi, I know you guys," um, and this is kind of. And this is not met with the kind of like the awe and respect that he would expect. Mm-hmm. Um, back over in B side, um, uh, uh, so Rory is kind of he's not been allowed in to kind of go and study the guide Emmanuel because um, um, so old um, win owner thinks this is a bad idea because she's a very conservative person, <laughs> and. Uh, so Rory is basically having soup issues. Which is another Rory isn't. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you're right, Sean. Dan Abner seems to adore Rory. There's uh-huh. so there's so much good Rory stuff. I mean, if as we're discussing this, we'll spoil the various mysteries. But if you enjoy Rory, then I think this is a book that you will particularly uh, enjoy reading. 
because uh, yeah, this is for, for my money, it's his Rory to a T, and uh, yeah, and so there's various hints that are being dropped about the worsening winters and the guide Emmanuel, the Doctor and his mob. Um, uh, so the Doctor's kind of suddenly started turning on the power, uh, and uh, Amy's accusing him of showing off, and then there's a oh, they find themselves somewhere else entirely. Uh, yeah. And that somewhere else is the room that Rory's in. Um, is um, there's a kind of like a hologramic link between them, um, and there's quite a nice, a cool bit where Amy and Rory try to hug each other but pass through because they're holograms. It's it's written in a way that you think that maybe they've stumbled across a transmat mm. because mm. when we leave um, the Doctor, Amy, Annabelle, and what's his face, um, they're actually about to turn on some sort of machinery, and then we go to Rory, and then yeah. the next time we see, all of a sudden they've all met up. I'm like, oh my yeah. gosh, they're reunited at last! But no, no. <laughs> right. it's a trick. It's a trick. Yes, yeah, uh, but it's also it's a good way of getting information to Rory, um, uh, sort of about kind of totally disrupting the narrative, I guess, maybe. Yeah. The doctor tells Rory his plan that he wants to kind of sabotage the sabotage that the ice warriors have done to the, uh, the terraforming mm. equipment, uh, to, to undo the, the kind of the winter that's been, that's been created. And he asks Rory to get the, uh, the guide. So the, the Emmanuel that was mm. referred to earlier is really an electronic uh, manual, like a like a help guide for the for the town mm. and and all of the systems and equipment and um, so he just has to get access to it. But uh, the is it Winona is is yeah. preventing him from accessing the the council chambers, so that kind of leaves him in a bit of a predicament because he can't uh, can't get that information to the doctor. And uh, the ice warriors are starting to break into the telecoms room as well, and sort of one of the ice warriors um, sort of throws an axe, and uh, so that causes these sparks to emerge that overcome the doctor, um, and so that causes him to be split up from kind of Amy... Bell and the other guy, uh, and <laughs> <laughs> and it uh, it cuts out communications and it kind of yes. the, the 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 bridge equipment starts blowing up and exploding and yeah and Amy the humans are able to get through the the door and seal it but the doctor kind of stalls to give them a little bit more time to escape yeah thinking that he can kind of talk his way out of the the situation with the with the ice warriors and it's at that mm. point we're introduced to um the ice lord so the mm. the commander of the uh the ice warriors and i was very glad he showed up because he doesn't speak in a hissy way uh yes. the ice, i was just getting so annoyed because the ice warriors all do, is all just yes. written out for you and just like oh really this is yes. getting difficult and so his name is uh, was it Ixlia or something? I can't remember. Something to that. I've got it written. Yes, we we can call, just call him the Ice Lord. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Ice Please. Lord. There's only there's only but, one of him. Yes, yeah, sorry. But what's what's really funny is at one point the doctor says, "Well, can I call you Ix?" And the guy just goes, <laughs> "No." Well, you're lost then, or it says something to that effect. But there's a wonderful passage of a few pages, mm. which is mostly between just the Doctor and the Ice Lord, mm. in which the they're playing sort of a verbal back and forth, mm. in which he realizes that um, the Ice Warriors are there because they want to terraform the planet, just like the humans are doing, mm -hmm. because Mars is no longer inhabitable for them, uh, and that they've been monitoring the humans all this time without mm. the humans' knowledge, of course. Um, and the, the Ice Lord says something about these new he asks the doctor i think this is how it comes up well show us your ship that you showed up in mm. and the doctor's like well it's not really a ship and there's only three of us and there's me amy and rory and the, and the, the and the ice lord says something about no there's about 180 of you mm. and that's when we realize that they are not the only ones on the planet that there is a third group of mm. folks on the planet that we haven't known about the entire story i, I love that that was a real mm -hmm. good kind of like rug pull um, yes. Yes. And and here's our pin cushion. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, uh, yeah. So d the doctor as well. He's kind of he he's name dropping again, um, sort of referencing the these kind of clans and that um, the ice warriors should know him as the Belotzar. Uh, sounds very Klingon. Um, the um, which 
but is the, the cold blue star. And rather wonderfully, the Ice Warriors have never heard of him. Or this chap called Axilax that uh, the Doctor is sort of saying that he's best buddies with. Is that a reference to uh, Curse of Paladon or Monster of Paladon? Um, I googled him and nothing came up. So oh. I, I, I thought he was a Paladon dude. Then I wondered if he was Big Finish or something. Because there's a few Ice Warriors that kind of rock up in Big Finish. But no. I, I had the same thought and googled him as well. And, and I didn't see anything come up so i think it's just a random kind of future we learned we, we learned basically that the doctor's overshot by nine thousand years or so <laughs> and that eventually he will become f- friends or um i guess like respected with with his like clan of ice warriors but that's far far in the future and hasn't happened yet so kind of he he realizes his his error there should we go back to b-side yes Uh, yes yeah so um so the council come kind of charging out because they've heard all of the the commotion over the uh, the telecoms and uh, rory tells them that they're all being invaded by the ice warriors and to help the doctor he's got to reach the e-manual and uh winona because this is her purpose in the plot says this is a bad idea uh and she accuses the tardis crew of being the real ice warriors and uh, Vesta defends Rory's honour. And one thing I think is rather lovely is there is no hint of romantic subplot mm. at all between Vesta and Rory. I mean, obviously they wouldn't have from Rory's side, but there, there doesn't seem to be any kind of... You know, they, they are just people that are working together to get through this problem, um, yeah. which I, I thought that was quite nice, um, yeah. that, that, that we didn't waste any time on that. But just as kind of Vesta's basically, she's trying to get... Um, uh, all Bill to um, uh, to sub- to agree to let Rory see uh, the Emmanuel, and then suddenly the villagers um, some burst in and say that there is a star descending from the heavens, um, and the other stars are moving. So um, they kind of they go outside, and there's we don't actually see a lot of fighting, but we hear it um, uh, kind of uh, in a strangely non-visual moment and i think that it's at that point that we kind of realize that the uh the the fighting the the ice warriors aren't targeting the um town so much although there is some collateral damage but that what they're really targeting appears to be this group that as sean mentioned is kind mm. of this like extra 150 or 200 individuals that mm. were were previously unknown and and it's at that point i think that we get the big reveal mm. that uh, yeah. this third group and the, the creature that was in the prologue that we thought was a, an ice warrior with the red eyes is actually a uh, augmented uh, human, similar to how we had the kind of the cyborg rats. Um, we have these uh, humans that are, I, at first I thought they might've been grown from like the, the meat stores and stuff, but we later learned that they were, um, some some of the colonists that were still f- frozen that mm. were pull, pulled out of uh, hibernation and uh, had these uh, kind of physical changes done to them to make them mm. really kind of gr- grotesque looking. Um, Dan Abnett mentioned like uh, claws that are almost, almost like Wolverine type claws mm-hmm. yeah. and uh, yeah. different tubes and stuff sticking out of body parts and mm. Yeah. It's it's really cool, actually. It's a really cool concept. I mean, I hate to say this, but I really wanted to see a picture of it. Because mm. it's a, a description of a creature that you have a very hard time imagining yourself, at least in my case. And sometimes the books do this, where they'll describe an alien being or something going on that's very hard to wrap your mind around. Um, but still, he does a good job with it, I think. Yeah, and like sharp, gnashing teeth mm-hmm. like i think you mentioned like almost like shark like teeth like rows of teeth. yeah like yeah yeah that are razor blades mm-hmm. almost mm-hmm. Yeah. and it mm-hmm. and it turns out these are the creatures that were attacking the local livestock because mm-hmm. they they had to feed and um the we get to mention that the ice warriors are uh herbivores and don't mm-hmm. uh don't eat meat which is i don't know if we've had gotten that before or if that contradicts anything that comes later in cold war but we did get that uh that detail too yeah i don't think it contradicts anything i mean i remember i remember wondering whether it was new information but i couldn't think of any kind of direct contradiction 
But uh, yeah, uh, whilst all of this is going on, uh, Amy and Belle and the other guy um, start recreating scenes from Dragonfire. It's probably the only way to describe it, as uh, they they're, they're in some kind of walkways, and uh, there are ice warriors attacking. They decide to lower themselves o- over the walkways. Uh, yeah, and. Um, uh, fun ensues. Um, uh, I found that bit quite. Um, I, I don't, it, it just felt like we needed something to happen to Amy. Here we have an action sequence. There you go. Um, and uh, it was daft when Sylvester McCoy did it in Dragonfire, and it, oh, I found it daft here. But uh, yeah, that's. Well, what, what's cool <laughs> is that after they do the jump, after the three of them do the jump from one yeah. walkway to another, you think that they're free. But immediately after that, the Ice Warriors jump down, too. Mm. And these Ice Warriors are surprisingly agile, and they actually mention that. I, I just can't picture, like, I, I figure that these are the Trouton era Icemen or Ice Warriors. I swear to God, I just didn't say that by, on purpose. Um, <laughs> so I just can't picture them being that agile. I mean, at one point... They talk about them throwing an axe, and you know, it, it, it's as we mentioned, it uh, blocks the communication between the Doctor and Rory. But uh, it, it was a surprising passage, but yeah. a, a, a hard for me to picture. I guess I have no imagination. But anyway, so the the Doctor, I think, manages to convince the Ice Lord that he's on their side, and that he, well, he has problems, you know, morally with what they're doing at the present time. He wants to kind of align with them and uh work on destroying or neutralizing the augmented uh Mm. humans that have come about so they that group starts making their way within the mountain to the primary control room uh Mm. which is on a different level and uh amy and rory and or sorry amy and the the rest of the humans that got separated from the doctor i think also eventually make their way to to where the doctor goes i can't remember if it's because they got captured or chased but they they yeah they eventually meet up again yeah i think they're being chased um uh, but and and sort of back on um back over b side um uh sort of uh old winner uh, uh, she's basically having this bit of a meltdown because uh, she's kind of wondering what guide has has wrought upon them uh, and uh, then they they encounter one of these kind of transhuman things uh, uh, that says it is a sign to secure and protect the guide system uh, and uh, mm-hmm. it basically emerges that Winona has a secret uh, that's being passed amongst the generations but kind of like one person at a time uh but she's reluctant to divulge any further um and uh and and then uh, the doctor's hologram reappears uh and uh, he he kind of basically says what's happening to transhumans uh and and he then works out that the morphans aren't building hereafter which is the name of this world have we actually mentioned that anyway it's called yeah. Hereafter. Yeah. Um, um, but they aren't building Hereafter for their descendants, but instead building for their ancestors, uh, which um, I thought was quite a cool thing, because in, in hibernation are kind of like Earth's elite, and the Morphans are just the expendable workers, and they will eventually just be a food source for the elite when they wake up. And uh, that was a rather wonderfully mm-hmm. macabre, macabre mm-hmm. twist. Mm-hmm. I thought, yeah, there certainly were quite a few twists in in mm. this where you think it's it's a it's one type of narrative, and then some of the the detail it's not quite as you might think you mm. know from from the outside. Yeah. And so uh, Amy now enters um, sort of the doctor's kind of sort of room because the doctor's got to like a comms room uh, whilst he and the Ice Lord and their folk have been walking around, and so Amy's gotten there as well and. Uh, uh, pursued by transhumans who then suddenly start fighting the ice warriors and again we have another one of our very visual sequences with kind of all hell breaking loose up there rory kind of meanwhile has kind of managed to break into the encrypt um uh, having kind of got past some padlocks and whatnot and he grants access to the guide database in the doctor's room he's kind of being forced out of the inner council chamber but he's able mm. to 
to send or to upload the guide or email the guide to the <laughs> yes. to the to yeah. the doctor yeah um so that yeah. the doctor can understand how to uh to fix the problem yeah, to, and to to, yeah. to shut down the uh the transhumans and he's able to uh almost like uh i was thinking of uh the best of both worlds with locutus where he sends the borg all to sleep kind of does that command yeah yeah he, he kind of basically kind of get gets the entire system to go into hibernate does this by using his his sonic screwdriver that's just finished yeah, recharging yeah yeah and and then says come on daddy needs a brand new planet oh, oh it's it's a very matt smith thing to say but it's annoying um <laughs> Just like the Geronimo references that have yeah. rocked up earlier that we've not shared with you. Um, it was like, oh, yeah, no, they did say that in those days, didn't they? Anyway. Probably can't uh, picture Capaldi <laughs> saying that. <laughs> no. No, no. Well, maybe he does in Thin Ice, which I've seen and you guys haven't. Um, yeah, yeah. He, he doesn't. He doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thin Ice, the, the episode that just aired takes place at the frost fair which uh i guess big finish did first back in 2007 or so they did a whole uh whole story set there with the first doctor so so i'm guessing that the uh the doctor nardle and bill don't run into uh the doctor steven and vicky do they safe to say that doesn't happen okay <laughs> <laughs> that's mm. it. That's mm. it. yes so the the doctor effectively neutralizes the uh augmented humans mm. and sends them back into hibernation and he convinces the ice warriors to abandon their kind of they've been there for 10 years now doing this kind of long game to uh change the the climate and uh he convinces them to instead relocate to a different planet which is still nearby but is more mars-like than earth-like so the ice lord reckons it looks like a cold blue star which is the translation for the name that the doctor thinks that the ice warriors call him um so it, it all kind of ties in nicely because this apparently this kind of new planet will also be the home for uh Azlax, uh the chap mm. we spoke about earlier so uh, yeah, that's all that neatly sorted. Uh, so all the all the references the doctor made to the ice warriors will will still happen nine thousand years in the future. But yeah, on this on this new colony that's orbiting a, uh, I think it's a blue dwarf star. So that yeah. Yeah, and uh, the doctor also decides to um, takes the opportunity to improve the guide's kind of UI, kind of like the user interface, so it's less cryptic and uh, more useful for humans, which is good. And he also resets the hibernation parameters so that um, the people of B-side and C-side and A-side uh, can choose um, uh, when um, the um, the elite um, will wake up, if at all. And the, the end scene is kind of written similar to like a uh, Christmas present exchange where, mm. you know, the Ice Warriors get their new planet, the... Uh... <laughs> The, the Morphins get their new guide. Rory's present is he gets to fly the TARDIS under the Doctor's close supervision. Amy gets her mitten back. <laughs> <laughs> and and the Doctor gets his uh, psychic paper back. So everyone gets a little something at the end. Yay! Isn't that sweet? <laughs> yes. So. What did we think? Should we ask our guests first? Yeah. Sure. Sean, how would you rate this? Such- <laughs> uh, I would give it, I would, you know what, I I actually kind of like this. I know I've been sitting here and you guys have been doing most of the talking and describing because I don't remember what happened bit by bit in this story that much. But um, standing back and looking at it as a whole, even though I've been kind of snarky and criticizing bits and pieces of it, as a story, it really is pretty good. Um, it's It's much better than most of the new adventures that I've written. Or that I've read. Sorry, I don't know why that why I said that. <laughs> I don't want to run a new adventure. Um, it wasn't a Freudian slip, but um, it was the story was pretty solid. It, it, it fails a little bit in that, and I think um, I don't remember which one of you guys mentioned it that that he's a comic strip writer. So a lot of the passages are very visual, and sometimes they work, and sometimes they don't. And it also felt, uh, it also, I also, looking at it objectively and critically, there's just a lot of chases going on. Like the entire book almost are the ice warriors 
rambling after our protagonists and chasing them from room to room. When you look at it that way, I suppose it doesn't seem very good, but somehow it all kind of worked for me. Mm -hmm. And it was also very 11th Doctor-ish uh, mm -hmm. that he totally he totally loves the, the 11th doctor as well as rory i don't know so much about amy but i don't know <laughs> yeah amy has nothing really to do here does she uh, apart no. from apart from babysit same well which is yeah. bad that's a sad thing for anyone to have to do um, yeah. you can take her out of the story and none the wiser yeah uh, and on the flip side though we do get a really strong characterization of rory which i haven't read a lot of 11, other 11th doctor books but i can imagine that Amy is probably gets more of a focus in some of the other mm -hmm. books. And so that's interesting that we get a little bit of his uh, kind of thought process. And mm -hmm. I thought that characterization was, was pretty strong. Mm. I, I would love to read some kind of Dr. And Rory books. Um, um, I mean, maybe we've kind of, I mean, not to dismiss Amy, but, uh, but yeah, with the Dr. Rory traveling alone together for whatever reason would be kind of interesting. But uh, but yeah. Well, I'm I'm sure there's probably some that have been written by some Japanese women that you could probably find <laughs> on the deep recesses of the internet. In fact, if you find them, let me know. I think I may like to see that or read yes. that. Yes, I'll go troll the dark net for that now. Yeah. <laughs> so, Matt, what's your thoughts? I I like this one. I thought it was pretty solid. Um, it the characterizations were were strong. It felt like it could fit right into the 11th doctor era i thought some of the tropes in it were a little derivative like um they reminded me a lot of and you might not have seen this movie uh it came out in 2008 there's a movie called city of ember which is based on a like a young adult dystopian um book series i think it has four books in it but the movie had a uh, like harry treadaway bill murray toby jones tim robbins um mackenzie cook but it it's basically this entire story minus the ice warriors and mm. take the village and put it underground. And it's the mm. right, right down to like the, the one village leader saving, you know, a secret for the, the next village elder. And, um, it's a, it's a good, it's a good movie. Um, but it, it reminded me quite a bit of it, but I'm sure that's, mm. I mean, you could go back further to like state of decay or to other, um, science fiction stories too i'm sure this isn't the the first time it's mm. it's been done but i remember like last month saying you know i really want a book where we don't have a big reset button at the end and at least we uh yeah didn't get that <laughs> yeah. and uh instead of getting a base under siege it was more of like a village under siege but uh i'll take that it was uh it was good yeah how about how about you chris um yeah i I I, I I enjoyed it. I mean, I think of the the three books that we've read thus far, it's the one that I've enjoyed the most. Um, mm. And the uh, yeah, it, it it was a it was a rollicking read, as they say. Um, mm. I and mean, it was good 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 fun. Uh, there were one or two points where I, mean, I know everyone compares um, a sort of Matt Smith's Doctor to Troughton. But there were some points where he felt very Troutony, mm, uh, mm. but that might just be because there's ice warriors, etc. It's, it's um, and that might be where my mind was going. But there were one or two points where it it it, it, it he felt almost slightly more Trouton than normal. But uh, but yeah, it, it was yeah it it, it was good. Uh, just a shame about Samewell, but uh, yeah. yeah anyway. <laughs> Because you mentioned, Chris, that this came out, you know, before Cold War aired. Mm. Um, I thought Dan Abnett did a good job of not really tying down whether the Ice Warriors were wearing armor or not. Like every mm. time he described, because there was a lot of fighting in the in this book, but he always described like the Ice Warriors armor as like both being scale like and plated. So you could mm -hmm. kind of have it read it both ways. Um, yeah. One thing that kind of bugged me a little bit was like the timing of the story. So he mentioned that the earth and Mars, like the sun had expanded. So presumably it was set like, you know, post new earth or gridlock where you have the, the mm. expansion of the sun and the destruction of the inner mm. planets of the solar system. But I don't remember the ice warriors surviving that far into the future. Like when I think of the ice warriors, I always think of more so like ancient, you know, pre, you know, more more being contemporaries with like the Silurians, I guess. 
mm-hmm. maybe Hello, maybe Dawn. that's yeah that's true they they but the, but that's still that's you know 20 that's still in the it, it, yeah it's in the relatively near future yeah. isn't it i mean it's not um quite as far uh, yeah but whatever yeah <laughs> yeah we can I, we can be mystery science theater about it it's a yeah. story yeah. <laughs> yeah you know but matt i think matt you're right about the timing when you said timing i was thinking also the pacing um mm-hmm. of the story i i did not really care for that because there's a there's a like three quarters of the way through the book, or maybe seven eighths, seven eighths of the book is them, you know, with the ice warriors being chased by the ice warriors and the terraformers and, and all that. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden you find out about the transhumans and then all of a sudden the book's over. Um, <laughs> the, the reveal about the transhumans is actually kind of cool. Yeah. And we learn about them and we learn about the huge secret behind them. Mm-hmm. But I think I would have preferred to have that happen about halfway through the book or if not halfway, a little, at least a little bit sooner. Um, the whole subplot involving Winona and the fact that she knows about the transhumans and she's hiding it, it she's keeping it secret, that would have been a huge subplot if this was like a new adventure. I could mm. see her being a sort of pseudo secondary villain, if you will. Um, but I, I think perhaps he had that in mind and uh, they edited it out. I Maybe not, but the timing or the pacing uh, didn't feel quite perfect to me. And that was another... That's another critical point I have, mm. or a critical point, a, a criticism. There's also a, a running joke throughout the entire book, which I didn't really care for, where they refer to things as Earth-like, Earth-esque, or Earth-ish. I don't know if, you, like, where they continually yeah. brought that up over and over again. That that was one of the few things I was kind of like, eh, um, well, about. And and Amy keep keep call, kept calling them the Ice Men mm-hmm. instead of the Ice Warriors. Isn't that cute? Isn't she cute? She doesn't get the name. <laughs> well, we're gonna give us. We have to give us something today. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> and the doctor kept calling back to Victoria, <laughs> saying like, "She, she, she's the one who coined the name. Why can't you uh, remember it?" But yeah, yeah. So how would how would we rate this one out of out of ten? Um, Should we ask our guest first? Sure. I would give it a seven. Um, it, 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 it didn't blow me away, but it was a good solid week's read. Um, I, will I remember it in six months time? Probably not. Would I like to see this story translated into like a two parter for the series? Absolutely. This would make a really good, uh, this would make a really good TV program or not TV program, but episode, I should say. That's one of my little criteria in my head whenever I read (laughs) these. Like, would this make a good televised story? And I think this would make a smashing one. With the exception of trying to depict those ice warriors as being so, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Acrobatic. I don't know how they would achieve that (laughs) on the screen. Oh, and there's one part. There's one part. I'm sorry. I'm going back. I don't forgot to mention. (laughs) There's one part. Where they're all hiding, all the ice warriors are hiding. I don't under under what, and they pop out to attack the transhumans as the as the transhumans are about to attack the doctor. And I'm like, what were they hiding behind? There must be huge columns or something that they were. Hiding. It's like <laughs> they all jumped out. Had surprise, we're ice warriors. I'm not gonna let you attack the doctor. I'm like, well, that doesn't translate well. I don't get what's going on there. It just bugged me. You know what the part that I'm talking about? Yeah, I thought I thought they were hiding by wearing sheets over their head like the Zygons were. <laughs> <laughs> I picture like there's one of them like underneath the desk where the doctor is sitting, like, oh I'm underneath here. <laughs> and they can't be faster than the transhumans. No. And by the way, I think that's a really bad term, transhuman. I just yeah. it seems slightly politically incorrect. I, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a term of the book. That's not a term yeah. that we came up with to yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so twenty eleven. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I'm going to agree with you, Sean. I, I had written down that I was going to give this one a seven out of ten as well. Um, I gave Engines of War a an eight out of ten, just because I think I liked the uh, all the continuity references a little bit more and how kind of how it tied into the fiftieth. Um, but this one, it's it's solid, but it's um, and I think it's really well written. I think it's of the three, it's probably the best uh, written in terms of easiest mm-hmm. to read and in terms of painting visuals and stuff i just i just found some of the subject matter are a little bit derivative but um that's probably because yeah. i've read a lot of sci-fi mm. but um 
yeah, so, uh, I would give it a strong seven out of ten. Mm. Oh, what should I do? I was going to say an eight. I think I'll still go with an eight. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, so, and yeah, as 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 Sean particularly sort of said, I mean that that yeah, if this has been a new adventure, this could have. And without want, I mean, I, I am a new adventure fan, uh, but this could have been so much more depth. And various other things, if if done well, uh, I I know I'm, I might be slightly misquoting you there, Sean, but uh, that, but yeah, no, that, that, yeah, it, it it could have it could have been better, but I certainly I I enjoyed it, and uh, and and yeah, and Rory was cool. So. Yeah, cool. <laughs> All right. Any other final thoughts about the book before we uh, move on to listener feedback? Not for me. Not for me. All right, so we have two pieces uh, this month. We got a question from a uh, Twitter message from Mark on Twitter. He wanted to know what the um, retro clips we used in our intro and our outro were. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of podcasts have uh, bumpers like that, I guess. Uh, Mm -hmm. The intro uh, is the uh, Children's Television Workshop logo from 1982 through the early 90s. 90s, It was used on PBS before... um, Three to one contact and some oh other gosh. things. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't thought about that in ages. Woo! I just had a flashback. <laughs> um, the outro is the uh, BBC uh, home video uh, logo that was used on some of the early VHS releases from I want to say like eighty four through mm-hmm. eighty eight or so. So mm-hmm. that's what those are. The other piece of feedback we actually got a real email like an email email a proper email. Hurrah! our first uh, non-tweet email so Taroja wrote us a nice email and they thanked us for hitting the ground running with our uh the quote real deal which is cool and uh thanked us for expanding out the new series and target books in terms of our the types of things we're reviewing and uh Taroja shared some thoughts on big bang generation and chris agreed with your rating of giving it a uh a six out of 10. They also got, went on to write that the books meant a lot to them because they got into Doctor Who when they were 12 or so um, back in the early 90s and knew who was far more of a thing uh, of print rather than television. Mm-hmm. And it's, But I'll, I'll mm-hmm. just read a couple paragraphs um, from it. Uh, they write, There's a dismissive attitude from some to the original novels, especially new adventures, for being too earnest and too concerned with continuity. My experience was totally different. As a young fan, they worked for me as the TV series had for others before, introducing me to sci-fi ideas, dealing with issues through either allegory or direct reference, and generally expanding my mind. They made a hero available to me who was an outsider, who didn't solve everything with a gun, and respected open-mindedness and learning. I also learned from them other things that the classic series could never tackle. It was in Doctor Who books that I encountered for the first time lesbian characters, transgender people, and a black lead whose social touchstones were from an African culture first and foremost. Mm. They didn't come across as, look at how brave we are uh, statements, but as things that were a normal part of life, and so of course they would be included. Mm. That, that's brilliant, yeah. That, 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 that's kind of um, quite similar to my experience as well. I, I think that's wonderfully put. Yes, yes, my, 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 my proverbial hat is off to you. So thanks, Taroja. I appreciate those <laughs> yeah. comments. And yeah. if listeners want to uh, get in touch with us, they can always send us a tweet at ANDWBC Podcast or send us an email at that same uh, address at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we, if, we will uh, potentially read, it, read out your uh, feedback on a future episode. Mm-hmm. So next month, uh, Chris, I think, is your pick. So uh, what, uh, what are we going to be reading? Well... I was thinking, let's go back to, was it the 70s or was it the 80s? Let's go back to the time of the master, time of unit, face of the enemy. Oh. (laughs) I think I've seen that one. Is that the one where Deanna goes undercover with the Tal Shiar? 
It's a Star Trek Next Generation reference. Yes. Oh. Okay. 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 Uh, There's an episode called Face of the Enemy. Okay. I've been yeah. scared of accidentally calling it Face of Evil. Uh, all to, all of today's episode, do not call it Face of Evil. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm looking forward to, um, to in my case, rereading Face of the Enemy. But uh, yeah. It's yeah. doctorless. It's mm. just unit and the master. I don't know if that's a spoiler. I don't think that's a spoiler. I think that's generally known. But mm-hmm. who wrote who wrote that? Do you know? Dave Does it... Oh, okay, all right. Which yeah. I think, Sean, you you reviewed uh, the Dark Path on the original mm-hmm. podcast, which is what the second Doctor in the Master. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. yeah. So that was when he was. Yeah. You know... So I wonder if this is going to be a kind of like a sequel to that at all. I know it's a different range, but maybe. Yeah, I haven't mm-hmm. I haven't read it yet, so I'm I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> My lips are sealed. <laughs> it also means we'll have to figure out how we want to do a dramatic reading next month. Yes. We won't, <laughs> we won't have an audio book for it. So, mm. Well, uh, I mean, if, if anybody wishes to volunteer their services, yeah, we, we'll, we're very open for any guest readers or anything. Um, yep. So, uh, yeah. Sean, where can people find you and uh, listen to you and follow your continuing adventures? I'm I'm no longer doing the Doctor Who Book Club, of course, but it's still out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can still download whatever episodes that you want of it. If you want, you can hear me on the TARDIS Tavern. Um, we are... Our next episode, which we recorded last night, is going to be about the Rebos operation. Um, oh, it's already out, actually. I, I released it this morning. Um, if you live in Texas or in the Dallas area, we're going to be at DFW Who Fest. <laughs> uh, Peter Davison will be there. I guess uh, <laughs> he was like, well, screw Minnesota, but I'll go to Texas. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. Sorry, Matt. Yeah, That's okay. <laughs> But uh, you can also listen to me on uh, the Classic Horror Cast, which I do with Kyle Anderson and my former co-host of the Doctor Who Book Club, Eric, and also uh, the Thousand and One Movies uh, podcast. It's based on the book, A Thousand and One Movies You Must See Before You Die. Uh, And I'm on Twitter at TARDIS Tavern, but I never go on Twitter, hardly ever, because I'm just a Facebook person. So. Mm-hmm. All right. We'll definitely have to have you on again um, yes. sometime soon. That'd be great. Certainly. I'd be happy to. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Well, until next month, I've been Matt in Minnesota. Chris in South London. And this is Sean in Austin, Texas. Happy reading. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the all new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. You can contact the show and follow us on Twitter at ANDWBC Podcast. Our music is the Doctor Who theme, Swing Jazz version by George C. Music, used with attribution under Creative Commons license. Until next month, happy reading. You know what? I've met you both before, haven't I? You guys have no. been at Gallifrey. I, you've met me, yeah. No, not me. I've never okay. been to California. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> but I've met you, Matt. Yep.